Well, we know, we know a lot of people will still be trickling in um, and getting seated, but so that we could make sure we have enough time um, to answer questions, we are going to just go ahead and get started. And we're going to give just a little brief introduction of ourselves, like 10 seconds each, and, um, and then we'll get started with some questions. Does that sound good? Well, I am Sarah Stewart, and um, besides introducing people, I also really love to just share wisdom and all those things, and I'm married, have three little kids, and I just love Aggieland. Hi, I'm Damaris Carbaugh, and I was born and raised in New York City. Um, met my husband in Charlotte, North Carolina. We had one daughter there, and then a son later on, and I love Jesus. <laughs> and I'm Jennifer Cumberbatch. I was born in Cincinnati, Ohio. Yay, Buckeyes. And um, I met my husband in Providence, Rhode Island. He's a New Yorker. And we have three children on earth and one in heaven. And um, I love Jesus. Amen. <laughs> well, my name is Ashley Bressenhan, and I am the executive director of operations for You Are and All Things that we do, Living Room Sessions and all of that. I was born in San Antonio, Texas. I, and I live in and San Sarah Antonio. lives in San Antonio um, and I live here now and that's my kind of full-time gig yes you're good um, and I also love Jesus we're supposed to say that right yeah. okay what if I didn't say it that'd be terrible I'm Lizzie Bailey I live in Northwest Houston I am married to Matthew for 22 years we have five kids two live here in College Station three are two are in high school one's in middle school and I've been uh Leading worship and such, since I was a teenager, I'm the full-time worship pastor of a church in Houston now. And I love Jesus. Yes. <laughs> I'm still a little, like, wondering if I love Jesus or not, so no, just kidding. I love Jesus, too. And I'll just be kind of, like, facilitating or moderating, but all of us will be answering questions, and we're just going to go ahead and jump right in. The first one is... What are two most impactful habits that have impacted your faith? And while I have the mic, I'll go ahead and just say one has been um, journaling. I have gone through some seasons where it's not been every day, um, but honestly, if I could, I would do it every day. It write, I write out my prayers, I write out my deep thoughts, my deep things where I'm like, hopefully no one ever finds this. Um, and when I was single, I wrote out every crush I ever had. Um, so that's been a really big like practice for me. Another one is the practice of corporate prayer in my life. I really love praying with the body of Christ. Um, two or more are gathered. He's here, there in their midst. And I'm like, Hey, just if I got one other person, I'll love to have some corporate prayer. So um, those are just two practices for me that have impacted my faith. What about you guys, Tamara? Let's just go down the line. We'll go down the line. Well, what has completely changed my life was reading the Bible. Just completely changed my life. And, um, and I, re I mean read the Bible. I just, I'm not talking about studying the Bible. I think it's wonderful to study the Bible, but I think many don't read it. That's why I just say read the Bible. The other habit I haven't found yet. Great. <laughs> The other oh, habit, I, I don't oh, yeah. I mean, we are, we believe in our church, the most important service we always announce is our Wednesday night prayer meeting, and unless I'm here, like out of town, I am there. So we believe in prayer, we love prayer. Um, my husband and I try to, we don't always do it together, but we try to pray a lot together every day. I am with him 24-7, and I still like him. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I think it has to be a prayer, and let me uh, add this caveat to it. Um, so I was well acquainted with um, be anxious for nothing but in prayer and supplication, make your requests known to God. And, and, and so I was very practiced in me speaking to God. But um, when I became a mother, I realized that that 
that there was going to be very little time to myself. <laughs> and so I've begun this practice of uh, waking up first thing in the morning, that time between when you know you're asleep, but you're not quite awake, and it, it's the, that twilight zone, and listening, Sweet. realizing that prayer is a two-way street. Mm -hmm. It's not me just making petitions. It's God literally speaking in my spirit person. And so I think that revolutionized my faith. Um, and the second thing was that when my father went to heaven, um, my father was a, the kind of person where um, if there was a need, I could always say, Daddy, you know. And I was like, where am I going to? And, and, and God literally said, your dad was a warm-up for you, for me being your father. And so, I, I mean, this, this was like 12 years ago. And I would just literally say, okay, God, you, you know, uh, uh, you know it, we're up on the deadline. You know, and just literally just say, God, I need such and such. It was revolutionary to really trust God for what I need. And sometimes what I want. <laughs> sometimes. sometimes. I'm starting to hope we're not going to go in order every time, so I don't always have to go after Jennifer. <laughs> um, but I'd say for me, outside of prayer and scripture, like they said, um, one of the biggest things that's probably been shaping me inside of scripture is reading Proverbs really often. That's probably the book of the scriptures that I've been in the most since I was a little girl, both my parents displayed. I mean, in the, and I think in our house, it was just kind of a thing. You knew there were 31 Proverbs and there's generally 30 or 31 days, not in September, but, um, <laughs> but just to be able to, I mean, almost daily be in the scriptures and learning what wisdom is. And then the other thing that's been really helpful is reading biographies of um, believers that are long gone, but were faithful. Um, Corey Ten Boom, Amy Carmichael, I mean, gosh, so many, Susanna Spurgeon, um, that I could list off and on, uh, or off, on and on. Um, those have been probably the most impactful for me. Mm -hmm. I agree with all of those, all of those. Deciding to just read scripture every day, regardless of whether you feel it or not, right. like uh, Damaris said, has been huge. Um, and the other thing is, I just, I feel like it's okay to ask God a lot of questions and then be quiet and let him answer. And he doesn't always answer right away. So I, I, I love nature. I take a lot of walks and jogs and stuff outside. And I just try to practice listening because uh, we tend to think of prayer as us talking, like you said. But just learning to listen and be quiet and say, what do you want to say to me, Lord? If you were like walking beside me, what would you say um, has really been transformational. Thank you, guys. Here's a tidbit on habits. Don't pick too many to add to your life. Um, make it very doable mm -hmm. and very inspiring to you. Please don't take it from someone else and make it exactly if that is not the way that you're going to do it. It's totally in your heart and like you have the freedom to do it. And that's honestly the best way you're going to like keep doing that habit. Because the worst thing that'll be for you is that every day you keep waking up feeling like a failure. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. just keep that in mind mm -hmm. with habits and forming them, especially around our spirituality. Um, so our next question is some good advice for women who are single in your 30s. Um, we see you. Um, so who could answer? Who could who answer, could answer who that? Who could answer that? Let me see your hand. Nope. <laughs> Nope, nope. Hey, I got it. Um, I was joking with Steph when they asked me to be on the panel. I was like, as long as I don't have to answer questions about singleness. But, you know, it's the pro. Sarah understands this, too. She got married later in her 30s, which, Lord willing, I will, too. Um, but I would say, um, number one, a lot of tied into, I mean, everything that Steph said this morning about not stuffing your stuff. Um, I've been really honest with the Lord about desires to be married and to have a family. Um, and I've also been genuinely content in God and have kind of seen, I, I don't see my life as like, this is a season of singleness and then I'll move into the season of marriage. My life has had many seasons within my being single. I just happen to be single in that. And um, years ago, actually, I remember in my 20s, I was really praying through, I was on staff at a church, I was praying through 
you know, should I go to seminary? But what if I go and get a counseling degree? And then, you know, um, or I'm like in the middle of it and just a few months and I happen to meet my husband that I don't want to like, you know, I just want to be home or whatever. And um, Steph actually, uh, who's just mentored me since I was in high school, I remember her looking at me and there was this moment of other than my mother, she probably wants me to be married the most out of anybody that I know. <laughs> and But she looked at me and she said, Ash, I really feel like, you need to live like you, you're not going to get married for a long time because I'm afraid you would reserve a yes for the Lord that he really needs and wants. And there's, um, I honestly kind of wanted to punch her a little bit, yeah, yeah, just a but little. also it was like that, that's true. And I've told her many times since then that really did free me up. I think there were a lot of things that God had for me that I don't know if I would have freely obeyed or freely said yes. Um, cause I was really kind of putting this limit on God, um, in that way. And so I would say, don't stuff your stuff say yes, regardless of your dating or marriage status and all of that. Be honest with the Lord. Marriage is a beautiful desire that he puts in our hearts. He created it, designed it, um, wants it for the world. Um, and so I, I would just say with all that, just continue to be honest and surround yourself with friends in lots of different seasons and stages of life. Um, invest in kids. Like I love my friends' kids as if they were my own. I love being Aunt Ash. I just kind of decided I'm not going to hold back on things just because I don't have this one thing that I would love to have. Um, and I've really seen God be faithful in the middle of all of that. So if you have a really attractive brother or a cousin <laughs> or... Saying that my mother would like me to say that. I think Blair said she was going to do a little giveaway on the live stream if someone finds my spouse. Something. but 20, 29 to 37, just about they 29. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Lizzie said they don't deserve me. Don't. It's, hey, we'll, we'll, we'll see. But uh, Sarah, you might have some stuff too. Yeah. You know, um, a big thing because, y'all, I was pretty boy crazy. Steph knows this. Um <laughs> I, I kind of joked about my journals, but legit, I had some like journals like full of the same guy. I was like, well, ending that one, uh, didn't date him yet. So, um, but I, this was the trial for me. I was single for 15 years and I think I liked a guy every one of those. Um, there was like six months at a time in there that I was like, I'm free. Oh my gosh, here's this new guy. What's going on? Why do I like him now? Um, so if you're like me in that, I just want to say, I want to free you that there is really no shame because your heart desires to be married if that's what you want. Even if you don't want to be married, your heart desires to connect with people. Okay, so you were designed to be in relationship with people. And some of, some of us, many of us, that will be a husband. Um, so I think just really, truly letting God into every one of those spaces for you is important. And he's not bothered by it. I mean, I remember there were so many times I'm like, here I am again, Lord. Um, he's like, what guys at this time? Um, but just to like cry about it, laugh at the Lord, release people, y'all, I raised up probably like five or six wives for these guys. I'm like, here you go. There's another, there's another. And so I got to have the privilege of, um, of the, like the joy of releasing when, we, when we're in our singles, we really, we have the most time that we might ever have in our lives. Um, and so we get to be partnering with the Lord to release many things in the kingdom. And I love that. But I add just one thing to all the moms of single people in the room, especially if your kids are in their 30s, I want to just even honor my mom and my dad. I actually lost my dad about a year ago um, to COVID. Um, but both of them through my whole life have honored God's call on my life and supported me in ways and never made me feel like I was kind of missing something. My mom would love to have grandbabies and a husband. Um, and, but in the same way, so she's, I know that, but she has never put a weird pressure on me or made me feel like I was doing something wrong or off. And she has celebrated the things that I'm doing and been a part of it. A lot of what we're doing, honestly, is because of my parents' generosity early on. 
Um, and so I just want to say, if you're a mom, like pray for your, my mom prays like nobody's business all the time. Um, and just invest in that way. Um, and then the other thing too, just, this is for single people too. This helps me because I know sometimes when you want something and it's being delayed and you're seeing other people get it. One thing that has helped me is just to remember I've been in gosh, so many weddings and I genuinely have enjoyed every time I've gotten to stand next to a friend of mine marrying a man that we prayed for um, because she's not marrying my husband. She's marrying her husband. <laughs> and so I can be excited for them. And so even just to remind all of the single girls in here too, like that that's kind of a worldly idea of like, it's like a movie thing of like everybody else is getting married. We can't be excited. We need to eat ice cream, whatever to, you know, drown our sorrows. Um, but that's really helped me just even understand that as I can gladly stand and support and bless them and be a part of their day, knowing they're not, they're not stealing mine. They're, this is theirs actually. So, oh yes. So last thing, um, become an amazing communicator and conflict resolution person <laughs> in your life as a single, because God is going to use every relationship in your life Absolutely. to sanctify you. Yeah. Yeah. And if yeah. you can partner with him to be really good at it, then you will be ready to live with someone 24-7 <laughs> and still like them and still like them and be able to work through some of the things you could never imagine. Like just because you're living with someone like all, every day and then you have children and then that even adds a new level of conflict, you know, just good conflict because you're learning about one another. And so it doesn't have to be bad. It can be really good. And singleness is a time when you can grow in it the most. That's so awesome. That's so awesome. Yeah. I have a 37 year old single son. Uh, that wasn't an announcement. It was just true. <laughs> and, um, and you know, I tease him because he has a really good friend that he met in college and, and, uh, People are going to see this. But anyway, I said, oh, you let her get away. You know, he said, mom, you know what? All my relationships are precious. And that is a lifelong friend. You seem to think that the highest relationship is for me to be married to someone. But he said, my relationships with all of my friends are extremely precious to me. So I've, I've never been 30 and single, but... But my son taught me something in that. So yeah. Okay. Um, we are going to move into, um, this is an encouragement for someone who feels like they are so deep in the dark and trying to get into the light. You know, uh, I, I can't remember who said it, whether it was Steph or um, Christine. Um, sometimes it's best to say, I don't know. Um, but I also believe that the word of God will never return void. So there's a, a scripture in Psalm. Let me just say, I've been through places that were so dark that I couldn't see up. Um, and there's a scripture in Psalm 139 and it's, it talks about how, where can I go that you can't find me? And I related that to Christine's, God is always inviting us. But the, the, the uh, part of this that makes me so joyous, even in a dark place, is that it says, it's a fact. Darkness isn't dark to you. Night and day, darkness and light, they're all the same to you. So the answer to that question is, I don't know how God um, is present in the dark and that God's not a stranger to the dark. Uh, light and, and darkness are the same to God. And God invites us even in the darkest place. Um, and it's, it's spirit. It's miraculous. It's not... Um, you know, my friend Donna, who played last night, said, um, and it was just like what Christine said, your uh, upper cortex can, and your, the uh, left side of your brain cannot make sense or logic of that. It's just that God is present in the light and the dark. And weeping, 
I'm, I'm a living testimony. Weeping may endure for a night. And the night can be longer. It can be long and interminable. But joy does come in the morning. It really, that's, that's what I do know. That's what I do know. Can I, can I say also something about <clears throat> may God truly reveal to this person that John in the gospel, his gospel, not the letters, but he said, the light came into the world, but the world loved the darkness. And I think some people won't admit that they love the darkness. You think you want the light, but I pray that you would admit that. See, the God can handle the ugliest truth. Absolutely. Even if your truth is, I've kind of grown to like darkness. But if, give it to God. Tell that to God. He can handle it. Not me. Don't tell me. <laughs> but, but I, I, I mean, I really mean that. But he is light. And, and though in this, the Bible does say that he's in darkness. In the sense of you can't get away from him. Even in your darkness, you cannot get away from him. But he is pure, beautiful, bright light. And may the Holy Spirit guide you to the place that you can admit, show me the beauty of light because I've been in darkness so long that I'm comfortable with it. But show me the beauty of light. I love that so much. And just remember, as um, Christine was saying and others have mentioned, um, you know, secrecy and shame and isolation, they breed darkness. And... Um, you know, even just confessing to one person that's trustworthy in your life can get you started getting into the light. Amen. It says, live as children of the light. We, like, even, even if it was starting with, if you are a child of God, if you have accepted Christ, it says you have the spirit of God in you, you, are, you belong to God. So being able to even proclaim over yourself, I am a child of light. I am not a child of darkness. That is actually not my identity. And if Satan is bringing up darkness, mm -hmm. it's to shame you and to try to keep you buried. If God, if I just want to say to you, if you wrote this in because you know, God is stirring something in you, then you can know God will only and always bring up things and reveal them to heal them and to redeem them. God will never, I just, I, can I like be as strong as I can while tampering my voice? Um, he will never, ever uncover your trauma or shame or anything that has been done to you or anything you've done to shame you or to put you in some place where you're not free. God will never do that, ever. If you feel like he is, that's actually the enemy. Right. And it actually is not seeing God in, an, in right. the right light mm -hmm. in who he says he is. So I just want to encourage you, get things in the light. Mm -hmm. Just get things in the light. Mm -hmm. and, and, and if you I almost see this picture of like, a, like tape like over your mouth. And you can just start undoing it. Mm -hmm. You don't even have to wait for someone else to. You just can start. And um, it's not simple mm -hmm. at all, but, um, but there is freedom. Anyone else have any thoughts on that? Okay. I, you know what, Sarah, I do want to add, sometimes we feel like we have to make this big effort, and that's what struck me so much this morning, uh, and, and it's in Psalm 139. God will find you. Yes. And... That's all I got to say about that. Where are you? Yeah. Yeah. This is funny, but you can even ask him, God, will you ask me? Can I hear you ask me, where are you? I, I need to hear your voice. I need to hear your voice. Um, okay, so this is for creatives in the room. Um, so the question really is just how can I use my gifts? Um, how to use your gifts in the creative realm. And I am not someone who will answer on that. <laughs> Go for it, four ladies. Well, I think f for 
someone who is a follower of Jesus, the, the most natural place is your community, your Christian community. Uh, like Steph said, we recognize things in each other and we call those things forth. We create like our maker. We're made in his image. And so whatever your community is, maybe it's a small group, maybe uh, like for me, I always... My musical gifts were pulled out of me by others. I was not like, give me a mic and put me on the stage. If somebody says that, I'm like, ooh, red flag. But, peop- but, but that's why we invite each other. We say like, oh, wow, you, let me give you this opportunity. And so like if you're in a Bible study and you have gifts, like just be in relationship with people and lead worship for your Bible study. If you're visually creative, um, you know, hopefully you're sharing that in community and the opportunities will come and then doors just generally open from there. But I will say, develop your gifts. You know, like if you're a writer, take classes, get a degree. If you're a singer, take lessons. If you're, whatever you do, like it is your responsibility to develop that. You can't bust down the doors to exercise it, but you can develop it. And that is your responsibility. So take advantage of whatever you can to develop those gifts and be in community so that others can call that out of you. Um, I, I have a weird, my brain works very weirdly, but I'm very orderly, obviously can kind of, you know, run an event kind of side. I don't really see that as super creative, but I also was a graphic designer for years by trade, um, also a musician, um, lead worship in several places. And so I, I think a lot of that, like what Lizzie was saying, has grown over the years because I've kind of surrounded, or the Lord has surrounded me by really creative people. I actually let Lizzie, met Lizzie when I was a student, college student. I was a senior in college. Um, she was pregnant with her youngest, who is now like running around here somewhere at the time, but kind of being around her and some other friends of mine over the last several years, Shauna, who's running around taking pictures, um, has kind of, I mean, it's almost like fan that flame in me. I I really have never naturally thought of myself. I would never describe myself as a creative probably until the last few years of going, I guess I can't really refute that anymore. I think I've seen it too much. I've paid my bills literally with graphic design and all of that. Um, But I think one of the things too is um, like what Lizzie's saying is just kind of serve where you can. I think a lot of times we think it's it only matters if like the masses are seeing it, um, where I don't think that's the case. A lot of times the things that have meant the most to me have been something that someone just personally has done or given to me, handed to me. One of the, my most precious gifts was a friend of mine is a painter, an artist, and Steph had her just literally, it's just a word with this picture on it. And it is one of my most precious gifts I've ever had. Not, not a million people are going to see that. Only if you come into my house, do you see it? And that has ministered to me almost more than hearing, you know, somebody great on a stage or um, something like that. So I'd say just maybe don't chase the masses seeing it all the time. God may very well put you in that place, but will you just serve where you're at and be faithful if it's kids ministry, if it's in your home, I mean, moms that I know that are really creative with their kids, it's really incredible. I'd, I'd like to share something. My mom was tone deaf. Very funny. My father was a classical pianist and a fabulous singer. They get married and my mom says, God, give me a musical family. Do you know what my mom would do? In, I was born in 55, so when I was like 10, 65, 66, 67, a matinee on Broadway, you can go to for about $5. My mom would take my sister and I to see the best Broadway show I ever saw in my life, to the point where every other Broadway show was like, eh, I'm dead serious. The best Broadway show I ever saw in my life are you ready for this? Was the all black cast of Hello Dolly with Pearl Bailey and Cab Calloway. I was never the same. But I wanna tell you something. I also heard really good singers and really good acting. And I think I realized you should do that if that's your gift. You remember Simon on American Idol when somebody was really bad? Remember what he would say? Who are your friends? (laughs) 
They didn't tell you. So, I mean, even though Lizzie, she's, you know, she was not like me. I was, I was the give me the mic. But she's musical. She's, and she, maybe she was shyer about it. But thank God that she probably had people that encouraged her and says, yes, do this. But, um, but find out what your gift is because my mom's gift was not singing. But all her children were that way. But she took us to see people that were really good. And though, you know, I learned some things about that too, but, but still, I just, I just, I just, it breaks my heart when people are trying to like break down a, a, you know, a door like that, I'm gonna do that. And that may not, it might not even be your gift. So may God lead you and guide you. I believe we all have a gift. Yes. And God will show you if you, just go to him like a little child and show me, Daddy, what my gift is so that I can do it and enjoy it and others might be blessed. That's really good. I just want to add, Christine said this a little bit, but this is so important. We tend to think of creativity as people who paint or compose music or sing. Y'all, if you are a living, breathing human being, you are creative, period. It doesn't mean you're Picasso. It doesn't mean you're Mozart, but you are creating something. We all are, and we are most alive when we're creating, whether it's creating peace in a relationship, Mm -hmm. whether it's creating a meal for Mm -hmm. people to enjoy, whether it's creating a space that is safe for people to, I mean, all that is creativity. God calls us in the beginning, in the garden, he said, What did he say? Take the raw material of creation and make something more beautiful with it. That is every one of our mandate. That's being human is being creative. So yes, press in, figure it out and do it and do it in community. And it's spiritual DNA. If we're created in the, I, I, I often say when you look at the enemy and how he deceives us and steals and kills, it's, I mean, verbatim, it's the same thing over and over again because um, the enemy has no creative power. But we're made in the likeness and the image of God. So when God is, uh, we look at that as the DNA of being created in the likeness and image of God, every last person, every last human being, to be human means to have the capability of yes. being creative. Amen. So, And a beautiful thing. Oh, my gosh. I love that scripture in Genesis where it says, and he created, what, what, somebody needs to quote it. Um, but <laughs> he created uh, all the trees, the seed within some, and someone, and some of them just because they were beautiful. Yes. I mean, we crave beauty. Yes. We yes. crave beauty. Yes. Yeah, it, does, it definitely heals. Yeah. You remember that movie, Chariots of Fire? Mm -hmm. No, well, y'all don't remember it, but I remember it. (laughs) 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 Sorry. Oh, you guys are closer to my generation than I thought you were. But there's a line in there where somebody asked him why he runs. And he said, because God finds delight in my running. Yeah, I, I feel the pleasure of God when I run. Yeah. And that's, that's why I sing. That's why I write. That's why I do whatever I do. Because literally, it delights God. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Love it. Love it. Okay. Um, this one's fun. Um, how do we lead toddlers? We let them run around and we just say, let me know when you're done. I'm just kidding. Um, I have a toddler and um, she's three and she's wonderful. And she uh, has a lot of big feels. And um, we talk some about the brain being the downstairs brain being like the back and the upstairs brain being the frontal cortex. She lives in the downstairs a lot. And so we have to walk upstairs together um, in her cooling off. But one of the biggest things that I'm learning right now with toddlers is giving lots of choices before the hard behavior, just all throughout the day. Just, do you want to wear this dress or you want to wear this one? Do you want to wear these shoes or want to wear that one? What do you want to pick on this? Do you want to 
color this or do you want to color that? And so all throughout the day in my time with Colette, I can be giving her empowerment and giving her choices. And then when it comes time to maybe a time I need her to listen and obey, um, we, she has that moment. She's been learning that I have choices I can make, even though she can't understand it completely cognitively, you know? Um, cause that can be the hardest thing with toddlers. You, you realize you have a lot of power. You want a lot of power and your brain doesn't understand enough about this, um, for us to reason together. And so, um, so that's just been one of the biggest things for me is, uh, learning about, powerful parenting and how I do not have to feel powerless to my toddler and um, I can walk in peace um, even when she disobeys we can give choices do you want to sit in the, I've been borrowing it from one of the ministries lately do you want to sit in the no fun chair or do you want to go play when you're ready to have fun let me know when you're ready to have fun and then we'll play again and y'all I'm just I'm trying to just walk away more quickly great let me know when you're ready to do that. Walk away. Let me know when you're, oh, you need just the redirection. So for toddlers, redirection is huge. Um, it's not always needing to be a, a punishable thing or like a, a big to do. But, um, but those are just some little tidbits for me that I've been learning with toddlerhood. And it can feel intimidating, some of their emotions and learning how to help them even regulate their bodies. Um, but I love the smell the candle. Nope. Smell the flower. Sorry. Blow out the candle. So even Colette go, you know, and so you can teach your toddlers things like that to regulate their bodies because they don't know what to do with all their emotions they're feeling. So as safe as you can be in that while giving calm consequences to, you know, uh, misbehavior, um, you can, you can really see a lot of progress. So babies, one-year-olds know how to choose. Do you want pizza or do you want cake? Do you want this or do you, you know, even at one, they know how to make choices. So those are just some thoughts. Um, what about you with, uh, teens, Lizzie? They know how to make a lot <laughs> well, more choices. Well, they're all here so they can come up and give testament, I think. But, uh, it's real hard. We have, we had four teenagers at one time. Uh, one is now, t our oldest is 21 and our youngest is 11 and they're all within that span. So we have three teenagers now, but, um, I think the, the thing that we learned and very imperfectly and you know, your prefrontal cortex isn't fully developed till you're 25. Okay. So I'm married to a therapist, so he would have been lighting up at Christine's talk. We've all heard all of it. Our whole family knows what the amygdala is. We know all about it, but, um, the way I was raised, my parents were very, very rules focused. It was very legalistic. It was very sort of fear based. Do this, do this, do this. If you don't, you're bad, you're in trouble. So I wasn't close to my parents. So I was like, I will be damned if I'm going to do that with my kids. We're going to be close. We're going to be open. So the other extreme of that is it's a party all the time. No rules, nothing. And that wasn't good either. So we had to kind of figure out like how to do it. And we don't really know still, but um, we just are really honest with our teenagers. We don't treat them like, I mean, they're human beings. Like they have all the feelings, they have deep thoughts. They have, so we try to just talk to them. And, and I, I am, I don't always handle things well. I mean, I've blown up at them and middle school's hard. And, but I think, Talk to older, wiser people. I think listen to your teenagers. If you feel like you're getting emotional, just walk away and calm down. Take some breaths and come back and just be willing to listen and be willing to admit you're wrong. Oh, my gosh. I never, my parents never apologized for anything. I mean, they did older, but when I was a teenager, they never did. And my dad had anger issues, and but he never, and so he would blow up, and it was kind of traumatic, and and so I, you know, I had to learn how to go, oh, it's hard to apologize to your kids to say like, I shouldn't have done that. That was wrong. That was stupid. So we tried to do that from the time they were young mm -hmm. so that they know adults screw up too. We're not, we're going to mess up. And so we've tried to just be really honest with them and, and celebrate the good. Don't just correct the bad. Yeah. 
like that's so imbalanced. We tend to just, oh, let me just fix that, fix, 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 fix. But celebrate the good. Celebrate when they're learning and growing. And I don't know. It's a journey. It's very imperfect. <laughs> Can I say something? Yeah. Um, I'm not a parent, but I have been parented. Um, and I would say one of the best things, I feel like this is um, probably my parents' like parent moment of my life, but when I was in middle school, um, I was in leadership. I was at a Christian school, like kind of on, you know, student council kind of stuff, all that. And I just found myself kind of in a place where I just was really not living up in integrity, even as a middle school kid, just making choices that weren't wise, really in, in sin, even being lying to my parents, deceptive, all that. And my parents lovingly said, Hey, you cannot do, you cannot lead um, spiritually or in any way and live your life in this way. And so they actually had me step down from that role um, as a middle school kid. And, um, you know, I, I went to a Christian school. I went and talked to like my Bible teacher, just shared with her kind of some of the situation. And, um, and I remember in the moment they, they did it in such a way where it was, Hey, we're really wanting to hold you to a standard of holiness, but it wasn't this like fear mongering thing. It was, Hey, you we're not going to let you live kind of doubly. And so in the same way, I think you can parent in a way where there, obviously you have to have rules and boundaries and you're teaching them what's right and wrong and training and shepherding them, but in a way that's um, loving and helping them. And I guess, I think my parents knew and understood you have a leadership calling on your life. So right now we're going to teach you how to do that in a way that honors God. And they did that while they themselves were living that out. My dad was an incredible leader who was full of integrity. I mean, just led the way in humility and patience and kindness and would ask for forgiveness, all of that. My mom, the same way, just led beautifully all these women. And so I was seeing it played out in my home and they were holding me to those standards too. And so I just want to say, if you're a parent and you have a kid that you see so much in them, but you're kind of afraid to jump in and connect, just ask God for wisdom and how to do that. You are supposed to, they're in your home. You're supposed to be a part of shepherding and parenting and pastoring them um, in your home. And if you don't know, ask someone who's further down the road. Um, I know that my mom um, and dad both had older people that were mentoring them and teaching them how to parent us. My mom was the first believer in her family. And um, just really because of the impact of these women, it changed the way that my mom parented us um, as she grew in her faith and knew the Lord and grew in that. And so I just want to say that on this side, you know, 30, I'm 34 now. I'm very grateful that my parents stepped in and held me to account on that in a really beautiful way. I love that. Thank you all so much for your thoughts. And one little thing that came up for my heart um, when Christine was teaching um, and this is, has to do with parenthood, especially with young, like littles, even toddlers, is how beautiful it is when she said, practice being invited by the Lord. This is where I feel like I could cry, but I just think so often my kids are asking me to come be with them. And it's just, they're never too young to like invite them to come play or invite them to do something because that opens the door for them to feel like we ask, where are you? Like, we can do that all through their teen years. Where are you? Like, I see you. Kids love to be seen. We all know that teens love to be seen, maybe not publicized or put on the spot, or, but we want to be seen. And we can really parent all the way from young to until they're out of the home, catching them doing right, thanking them for who they are, thanking them for loving our family well, thanking them for being responsible, even at two, or thank you, Colette, for throwing your package away in the garbage without being asked. That's amazing. Teach your brothers. Um, so, uh, you know, that's what we can do, and we can invite our kids, and through that, we can lead them really well. Um, so, we just thank y'all so much. This is We're going to have to wrap up our panel session, but thank you for just being with us in this time. We are just glad to be able to like share our hearts and answer questions that um, some of you have asked. So we will have a very short break. Um, so the prayer room will not be open, but it will be open after the next session. So you have 10 minutes right now um, to just do what you need to do, and then we'll come back for our next session.